1866, when DePaul was known as Indiana Asbury, and about 11 years before this drawing was created of the Wabash campus, the two institutions battled for the first time on the baseball field. When it comes to football, history books suggest DePaul played Butler in 1880 and lost. A brief account in Asbury Monthly described it as a disastrous defeat. In 1884, DePaul and Wabash each played one game against Butler, with Wabash winning and DePaul losing. The DePaul squad was so forlorn, it took out an ad in the student newspaper offering to sell its football on the cheap. It would be 1889 before DePaul would play another official game. This is the team photo from that year. While their soon-to-be rivals played three games in 1886, one in 87, and like DePaul, two in 89. This is an illustration of the Greencastle campus in 1890. Even before the first snap in this series, on Greencastle street corners, there was late 19th century trash talk. DePaul's record asked, is there a college in this state by the name of Wabash and has it a football team? The first scoring came when DePaul forced a Wabash safety. DePaul halfback John Miner scored the series first ever touchdown and the final score on a beautiful day was 34 to five in favor of the visitors. The class that would graduate in the spring of 1891 returned to the Greencastle campus for their reunion 30 years later as the first to ever witness a DePaul Wabash football scrape. Installation of a new underwater cable in 1891 allowed the first telephone conversations between London and Paris. The first traveler's checks were issued, and 43% of DePaul students were women. Legendary DePaul professor Joseph P. Naylor joined the Department of Physics in 1891, while the campus newspaper reported a photographer named Kerr had taken a great shot of the football team. But these men would not have a face-to-face -face meeting with the squad from Wabash. The gripe from Greencastle was that one of the Wabash players was not a student at the college. On November 20th, the day before the scheduled game, the manager of the Crimson team sent a telegram south announcing that his group could not play and would forfeit the contest. But there would be other things to see. Days later in Springfield, Massachusetts, James Naismith took a soccer ball and a peach basket into a gym and invented the game of basketball. Early newspaper reports typically listed the heavier team as favorites heading into a football game, and the DePaul men, averaging 180 pounds each, were given the edge in 1892. For the record, this guy, right tackle Jerry Simpson, tipped the scales at 168. The game must have been a big deal. DePaul's Philadelphian Literary Society postponed its meeting on account of it train carrying the Wabash team and about 30 other students from the college arrived in Greencastle at 2.20 p.m. and the kickoff took place an hour and 10 minutes later. Where on campus it was played is a mystery. A report says there was a decided slope on the grounds to the north goal. It was all downhill for Wabash after their rivals scored early and often in a 42-4 run. Photographs allow us to take a trip back in time to a DePaul laboratory and to peek at the cover of an 1893 syllabus for the course Economics, Money and Banking. This is the DePaul team that made the trip to Crawfordsville for the fourth edition of this nascent rivalry. The morning of the contest, Wabash students and faculty build a fence around Philistine Field in hopes of boosting attendance. It worked, 200 DePaul fans bought tickets that afternoon. When he wasn't posing with a bale of hay, DePaul captain Arthur Whitcomb was a force. He scored at least two touchdowns and kicked eight extra points in the 1893 game. Other touchdowns were registered by his equally dapper teammates, E.W. Albright and Jack Kuykendall. The visitors led 36 to 22 at the half and each team scored 12 points in the second stanza. A boastful DePaul newspaper summary of the game likened Wabash to a defeated campaign rooster and suggested that the Crawfordsville mayor knew he was safe when he told the Wabash team before the game, boys, if you win, you can have the city.
In cities and towns across America, indignation toward the game of football was growing in 1894. Fist fights, free for alls, non students playing for colleges, and a number of deaths on playing fields led some schools to scrap their teams, and the dangerous formation known as the Flying Wedge was outlawed. DePaul's student journalists added to the debate. A front page item in the January 23rd DePaul Weekly examined the sport's future and asked, Has football dug its grave? By fall, the patient was still up and around. Here's a look at the 1894 Wabash team. And this is a stunning shot from the DePaul Rose Poly game played in November. It's not clear where at DePaul the contest with Wabash was played. Photos from the era suggest East College Lawn may have been a venue. For the first time in five meetings, the men from Crawfordsville would prevail, led by hard-hitting fullback John Fry, the captain of the Scarlet team. DePaul had a school of military science and tactics in 1895. Its activities included firing cannons on East College lawn. The university opened its own athletic facility, McKean Field, that year. This shows the baseball team at play there. And this image depicts the candidates for the track team. The yearbook lists 16 players on the football team's roster, but the squad was no match for Wabash, led by fullback Albert Babe Ristine and the eventual state champion. 500 fans witnessed a 6-0 victory for the footballers from Crawfordsville. A week later, DePaul lost to Missouri, then went on to beat and tie Indiana University in consecutive contests. The Wabash College Athletic Association, which was run by students, was in debt, and the football team played only five games in 1896, winning just one. The DePaul team, seen here, had an early and rough scrape with an athletic club from Louisville, which turned out to be a group of, according to one account, hardened professionals. A story in DePaul's student newspaper was headlined, Rotten. It reported that a Louisville player pulled a gun during the scrimmage and relayed a final score of 26 points for cigarettes, brute force, and foul play against 12 for science, self-control, and manhood. Three weeks later, the women of DePaul's Alpha Chi Omega chapter were among those gathered for the game with Wabash. The editors of the DePaul Weekly predicted the Tigers would shut out their rivals, and they were spot on. A veteran DePaul team logged a 20-0 victory. 